Kia ora and welcome to another episode of Inside Netball on Sky Sport where we are very excited today because we get to welcome in one of our favourite guests on the show, Dame Nolan Totoa. Now that we're over the halfway mark of the ANZ Premiership, but before we get to that, let's talk about round seven. Jenny, a dean, big talking point for me, the rise of the Pulse. Two big wins in round seven, including one over the Mystics, a dean. They're timing their run well. They are timing their run well, but look, they should be good. Like, they should be good. They're, they were the champions from last year. And I was looking at their two key changes to their starting seven. And their key change, obviously, they lost Alia Dunn. But they've got Amelia Wormsley, who's just come out of the woodwork and has been amazing. And then the other change was Etikata Pedersen has gone. She was playing in that centre role. Maddie's moved into there. And you've got Fa'amu Ioane. So... I'm like, Oof, so they should be. They should be, you know, close to the top of the table. They won last year. They've had a core squad that's been together a really long time. They've got a very, very good coach and event. So I'm not surprised, um, but I'm happy, happy to see them there. Slotting in a new shooter, though, is such a big piece of the puzzle. And, you Absolutely. know, Amelia is young, and I guess we shouldn't be surprised that it has taken them a while to... I hope they haven't hit their peak, but, you know, peak at the right time. Um... I don't know. What did you make of their performances, Jenny? Well, she was there last year too. Remember, she, was. she didn't she get a lot of court yes. time. Yeah, Came on in the final briefly. I, actually. you know, in a rare moment, I agree with you. What? <laughs> what? Because I must admit, I had thought, you know, gosh, when are they going to hit their stride? And I thought that game against um, when they uh, beat the was it the Stars last, you know, yes. the round before. Yes. I thought, wow, they they're back. I was a bit concerned actually that the, the game when they beat the um, the Mystics in the end, what they got. But home by two. Mm -hmm. And really, you know, that's a mystic side with no Sulu Fitzpatrick, mm -hmm. no Taylor Earl. And I think we saw the real value of Earl um, in that, particularly in that first quarter, because they just didn't adjust. I mean, they came good. But um, yeah, look, I, I think it was, it was a great round. I, I do worry for the stars. Yes, mm -hmm. well, that was going to be my next talking point. I, I like that you brought up the Mystics faltering without Taylor Earl because they did lose that first quarter 19 to 8 and that's very Ouch. hard to you know come back Ouch. from against a side like the Pulse. But moving on to the Stars, yes, they got the win. It was only by two goals over the Steel. So they didn't have three losses in a row, but it was only two goals. And then the Pulse beat the Steel by, what was it, 24? A million. A million <laughs> in the same weekend. So what is going wrong with the Stars? Yeah, and oh, I think for me, exactly that uh, storm. For a while there, I was thinking, wow, the Steel, they've got greatly improved. This is great. They've pushed the Stars. It, and then I saw the Steel get completely thumped by the pulse and it made me reevaluate the stars game and the stars performance and it's I, I'm really struggling to put my finger on what it is because you know I was lucky enough to do a number of stars games early in the season and they just had this amazing energy about them their connections it just looked effortless and all of a sudden it looks hard again and they're really having to work for every ball um, Obviously, they're, they're missing some key players, one of the defenders. But it's, you know, it, it takes me back to 2021, was it? When they were yes. on this absolute roll. Like, all the way to round six. All the way to round six. Lost Brilliant. The rest from there? Well, if they didn't lose all of them, they look basically all. So I don't know. I, I don't. What are you? What well, are you it's thinking? a bit of a worry, though, isn't it? Because I mean, that's very similar to what happened to the Mystics last year. I mean, they were rolling on through. And again, it's Key something that happens to one player. Yeah. And I wonder if that is a weakness of our competition. And that, you know, we haven't got you know a zillion players in the world. We've got, as you both well know, um, you know, a small elite pool. Uh, and the minute that the, the depth gets scraped away, you know, we, we can be a little bit exposed. And I was interested in Kerry Will's comments before the game that we all did on um, whatever day it was between the, the Stars and the Steel. Steel, where she was sort of, you know, expressing that concern about the, the depth of defenders. And, um, you know, just what does happen if, if we lose any more to injury? Well, I can say firsthand <laughs> that defenders always seem to be the ones that get injured. I don't know, the injury rate... they play I'd, the hardest. I'd love to see a stat, ah. but I feel ah. like the injury rate of defenders <laughs> must be so much higher. Or are they softer? 
Oh, I don't know. Shooters just get up and <laughs> they just carry on. The thing is, defenders don't get to make decisions on the movements they make. It's very reactive. Ooh, yes, you know, like, like if someone changes direction, you're a defender. You have to do that really quickly. So that's when your ankles go, your knees go, rebounds. There's eight feet in the circle. You're not really controlling when you're jumping for a rebound. You're reacting. So... That's my piece. As eight feet biased. in the circle. I never, th I yeah, never, I, did, yeah. I, I had think never about that for a second. I was thinking, eight. Eight. has she measured how many feet? But no, of course, eight, eight, eight limbs. feet. Um, but I'd argue, Jen, that they had lost Ali Timu, or they still had Ali Timu um, in that game against the Pulse, which kind of started that run of bad performances last week. Um, for me, I'd noted that there were ten turnovers between Maya Wilson and Amarang Amarangi Malasala alone, and we talk about the connection in the attacking end. I just wonder if their connection isn't quite what it needs to be and whether there was a way that we could merge Amorangi and Jamie Hume together <laughs> and then all would be Good fine. Good if you could do that, wouldn't, wouldn't it? Take well, the best of this person, that. that would be so it's good. like spill the tea with Auntie E when she, <laughs> you know, she asks people, what if you take a bit of that player and a bit of that player? But yeah, no, that's uh, fantasy world. It is fantasy world, right. Well, I mean... Great to get our brief thoughts on the ANZ Premiership Round 7 so far. But we would love to welcome in Dame Nolene Toto and now to hear how she's finding the ANZ Premiership and ask her a few questions that, you know, you may be wondering yourself. So let's bring her in now. Kia ora, Knowles. Kia ora. Good to be back again. Oh. I hope you're all good. Oh, thank you for joining us. We love having you on the show. Uh, my first question for you, Knowles, is the last time we spoke, uh, there were plenty of blowouts in the ANZ Premiership and we weren't too sure how you'd feel about the scoreline. Are you happier with the competition and the, and the quality at the moment now that we're seeing these closer battles? Yeah, look, halfway through the competition now we are. Um, I think last two rounds has been quite tight. Um, so that's been not exciting, but, you know, I've been uh, rubbing my hands together. As you mentioned right at the beginning, there were a few blowouts, and there still is to some degree with uh, steel. But I think now that there's quite a bit of positioning happening on the um, on the scoreboard, and every point counts. So I'm looking forward to seeing what it looks like in the business end. Niles, how excited are you about some of the individual performances, and particularly... Anyone that surprised you, maybe a la Bailey Mears? <laughs> Oh yeah, look, Bailey. As we all know, Bailey's a a campaigner not only for the Silver Ferns in previous years, but also um, in the ANZ. And definitely not necessarily surprising me, but I'm wrapped actually that she's been able to show her skill sets. She looks really confident in going um, to the post, and uh, her combination as well with Amelia Ann is growing every week. Um, so it's good to see her play some really quality netball out there um, and to grow and to show how good she is. So um, I think like always, you wait to the business end and as the games get a bit uh, tighter as to how players can respond, but also um, I think uh, really put their hand up for selection. So I think she's been cool and it's been really neat style of netball to watch with both her and Mills in there. Is that a real advantage, actually? I've just thought of that, you know, with um, Mills and Bailey. And I'm just thinking, too, also Jane Watson and um, Karen Berger. The fact they play together in their franchises, does that give them a little bit of an advantage? Um, what it does, I think, is that um, it grows that combination. Um, and because of that, you're looking for those combinations that you can pick up straight away and run with. Um, we had both Karen and also Jane in the quad series. And even though they had come off a return to play leading into that January series, we knew that they would build that combination going into tactics. So, you know, there was always some upside out of the been involved with us in the last round. Um, what it does show though sometimes is that you can't rely on just the combination that as individuals they've got to be able to do their job um, and if for that combination, say for example with both Jane and Karen, if they can't get the ball lifted then they've got to do their one-on-one -on -one work. So to some degree it's good but to some degree it can also expose other skill sets that they need to do that we know they need to do at the international arena. Knowles, how is your spine looking? We know you love talking about your spine. Has it changed since the combination? Uh, sorry, since the competition has, um, you know, moved along? 
how many numbers, how many numbers are in your spine. Yeah, we want to know the yeah, number. Is know. it five? How is it six? Can you tell us? <laughs> how many are on your plane so far? <laughs> Yeah, look, um, I, I think I haven't sort of quivered from this or, you know, jumped around from this question. And I think I've always maintained around six has been mm -hmm. our number. And to be honest, as a selecting group, we have queried ourselves and we will continue to really put that six under the pump or have those discussions that have they earned the right? Um, are they shifting? Um, and what does the combinations look in and around them if they remain our stable players? So, you know, even though in our heads and, and we know what the spine looks like at this given time, um, it's not a given. So, so I think that's a good thing. And every week poses something different and new from what's happened in the previous week. And we're waiting to see as the ANZ season progresses, whether they deserve to be there. Talking about that selection process, that's got to be one of the hardest parts of the job, I imagine. Have, have you ever had that last minute midnight change of mind and gone, oh no, we've got this wrong? Or have you always kind of, you know, has it kept you up at night in the past when you've had to make those t really tough decisions? Um, I think the good thing is that we've got a really clear process and uh, the timeframes has been planned uh, around the schedule and also the dates that's required by um, IFNA as well. So um, because of that way and I think because of the nature of selections, um, we go through the process of having a first cut then you sort of sleep on it and then you come back for the next cut to make sure that everybody is happy. So we might go through that maybe two or three times mm -hmm. before we actually come up with the final list that we know that we're moving forward with. So it is a bit of a process, but to be honest, you do wake up at night and you do have that feeling around different people. Um, and we've also got to be smart, I suppose, around the game style that we're looking at playing and matching that as well and the skill sets that's required against certain opposition. So ANZ is just one part of it, but also the work that's going behind the scenes with SSC and the international game, Jamaicans, and also our own style that we want to play as well. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned Jamaica because, I mean, this, this is the one that I think I would be waking at night worrying about just because, you know, they're so crafty and clever. Um, so how do you keep an eye on them? And also, are you kind of relieved that in a way, the way I read the draw, when you play them, you'll actually, it won't be a life and death one. You'll get another crack at them should you, should you lose. Yeah, I know, I know what you mean. Um, we've been tracking SCCN uh, and they're killing it over there. All the Jamaicans, holy, you know, like they are owning it, whether it's in both ends of the circle or uh, defence are turning over a lot of ball. And it's been quite interesting looking at them also in regards to the Australian players. So they're going to be a handful. As you mentioned, we will get either Jamaica or South Africa on the crossovers. Not that it's definitely detrimental you know we won't get kicked out as such but I sort of feel that if you're going to win the whole lot then you've got to win yeah. <laughs> that's how I think Makes so it even though you may lose you know it, it does nothing for us to know that we're actually moving in the right direction and we have confidence in the game plan that we put out there it's great to know that you've got a second life as such but you know those opportunities present we want to take them um, and for that reason, we've got to be really smart about our selections, particular people who can get off the body, who can contest the high ball. It's going to be Janelle. We know that. She's she's shooting 50 every day. She looks like a blimmin'. You know, she looks like a fine wine. Um, so the disruption that ha happens outside of the circle is really important to have those defensive um, people who can mark that way. So, yeah, it's big. You talk about your game plan and your game style and, and players who can execute that and, and how that sort of centres your selection. What can you tell us about your game style, if you were to put it into words? Um, what I do know, look, New Zealand has been synonymous with obviously our space marking and our zone. 
uh, we've held it on for so long and also the wall and those sort of things. Uh, we've been exposed to some degree in quad series and I'm fine with that because you don't want to move too fast too soon. Um, but it shows the gaps that we have to be able to plug. So, you know, there'll be a bit of variation coming off there. Um, I also know with what we've done in the past that, um, yes, zone or space marking is one thing, but also we've got to push uh, the opposition under pressure. Um, and sometimes we just go back into structure without attacking the ball. So it's not like we're going man on man because we sort of don't play that way, but we've got to really get into a bit more of restrictive marking and force the turnover higher than we currently are. Um, I think an attack, if I'm going to be honest, you know, like we do have set plays and things like that. I don't mind if we have to grind every game, every play to keep ball in hand, to take it to circle edge. I love space. I love depth. But sometimes, uh, you know, you just need to come towards um, each other and make sure that you create the space. So I've got to relook at that um, again as well. And uh, space, yes, definitely, but also our ability to grind it out, keep possession of the ball, put the ball through the hoop. I'm really fond of. It's simple. Look, Niles, <laughs> you know, this, you've got so many fans. People love you as a coach and you make it look so easy and you're smiling and all of those things. But there must be some tough parts of the role. Like, what, is it having to ring those players that have missed out? What are those things that are really, really tough as Silfern coach? You know, you get um, you get reviewed. <laughs> you get reviewed by every man and his dog, and we have reviews happening every um, after each pinnacle event or every series. And there's always things that you need to work on, and you can work on. I suppose sometimes, if I'm going to be honest, uh, selections really. I just I just don't like them. I I really feel for people. I know the intent of everybody is to put your best forward forward um, and and it sucks when you're not selected and sometimes it's not necessarily because of the person it could be because of a combination or a different style so you know making sure that you're really open and transparent around that is something that Debbie keeps me honest about <laughs> you know so I have really good people around me who make sure that I'm ticking everything that I communicate as good as I can I don't allow for any gaps and that we cover every piece that we possibly can um, so that's always keeping on my mind but I love I love the competition I love what international netball can do and be exposed and I love planning um, and I think a lot of it goes around that to see if we can put the business out on court. So, but if, you know, if my daughter, um, I always, this is another thing, you know, if my daughter was coached by me, um, being a mother as well, I would like to think that I respect, respect them. Um, so that's what I try and do with everybody that I work with. Interesting you say that, you know, we're all reviewed. I mean, you're reviewed, we're reviewed, the players are reviewed. And I'm talking more about, um, you know, social media, the, the trolls, the, all that side of stuff. And we've seen a few players talk about how hard it's been over the years for various players after certain incidents. Do you have a view on, on is there any way that we can sort of make sure that people are a fan without being a fanatic? I mean, can you control um, the way they react to games? I'm not too sure if we can. I think that's become a common theme now, not only, you know, Jacinda's getting it, everybody gets it. <laughs> um, and I think to some degree, because we're out in the public eye, we need to be able to expect that. Um, I know through past things, you know, you can take the goods with the bads. Um, how I deal with it is that I'm not on Facebook, I'm not on anything like that, so I don't read anything because I ain't got time to be reading anything. <laughs> Um, and I have a lot of other people that are around me who who tell me what I think, um, what I don't want to hear sometimes. So having those good people around to keep you honest and keep you level and grounded and to support uh, your journey, I think, is really important. So I think that's the hundred, you know, that's the debate that's happening around the place with social media at the moment and how you react to people's thoughts about you or what you're doing. Great advice. If we um, 
take it back to the selection process again. I just have a question I need to get off my chest. <laughs> Are you going to name 14 on selection day or do you just name 12? Uh, what does the squad actually look like? Because we don't actually know how that works leading into the World Cup. Yeah, look, um, the rules now that have come out is that we can name up to 15. Um, so you will name your 12 and the 15, uh, well, depends how you want to use them, either replacement or reserves or whatever it may be. Um, it's not a revolving door. So you can name or you can do a replacement Dream Netball World Cup. That is oh, different from what's yeah. happened in the past. That's yes, very you good, can. yeah. Yeah, so that's the change to that, but that person cannot come back in. So once they go, they're gone, and once you come in, you're in. Um, so that's probably the difference. Um, there will be a bit of work that we would need to do around that 13th, 14th and 15th person. Um, one is I don't want to take passengers. I don't want to take tourists. Um, that people need to be very clear about what their role is and their ability uh, and their happiness to some degree to be able to serve the 12, mm. I think that's really important. And to understand that everybody's in it together and even though they're in the extra three or the reserves or whatever, that they're part of it. So, you know, there would be a bit of work around the, the three to make sure that that person is right and that they... Um, I suppose that they can honour, I suppose, the team and the 12. Um, and that's a massive place to be in. So, you know, bit of work to do there. Yeah, that's a hard role, those extra three, because you do it so, role. so hard. But look, we, we actually threw it out there in social media this week. You weren't on it, so you wouldn't have seen it. But it was about those burning questions that people want. And I had one from Barnsley. Barnsley, and I know lots of people want to know this, is the World Cup, is, it, is that it for you? Are you going to stay on? Like, is, have you still got that burning desire or you're just putting it all aside at the moment and getting through this campaign? Yeah. Oh, good question, Barnsley. I think I get <laughs> asked this quite a bit. Because um, everyone wants you to stay. Sitting, That's yeah. why they keep asking. Yeah. They want you to say, I'm staying. It's, uh, it is sitting there, I must say. And, you know, I've talked to Jen, our CEO, and... Um, different people along the way. Um, I am mindful that I don't want to get distracted and that uh, Netball World Cup is, is everything that I have to commit towards at the moment. So I've sort of parked it in, in that respect. But, um, and I sort of believe in how I work that after the Netball World Cup, I will know what needs to happen next. I'm really mindful that I can, I need to contribute and that um, if I do stay, that it's the right decision. It's not just about me, it's that I can uh, move the players and add something different. Um, I don't need a job as such, um, but it also means that there's a lot of love and heart in there for not only netball, but also the silver fern. So I've got to be sure that I make the decision for the right reason. And then secondly, you look at the review. Uh, you know, you never, we may bomb out. We, you know, there might be a lot of things that could happen and I just need to go and exit, you know? Um, <laughs> So those sort of things we go through, um, but there's definitely, we're putting in place now uh, that process post Netball World Cup. Um, I will still be around to do uh, England and also Constellation Ooh, Cup oh. post Netball World Cup. Uh, so that would take me up to November. So irrelevant of what happens, whether I stay or go, um, it's not forcing Netball New Zealand into a, a stressful time that I can cover that, um, which will give them enough time to go to market if that's the phase that needs to happen. You're not going to do a rugby uh, situation <laughs> here. Where Please you no. <laughs> um, one thing that I was wondering about is the um, security aspect in Cape Town. Um, I, you know, it, there was a lot of talk beforehand, the Quad Series, as far as I'm aware, there, there might have been a few little incidents, but nothing too much. Do you send another, I don't know if it would be a, a security team or whatever, ahead just to suss things out ahead of, ahead of the event? 
we're very lucky. There's probably two things out of that. Um, we rely hugely on World Netboard to cover many aspects of the security um, and be very clear around the protocols, um, which, as I understand, is progressing. But that's also on the back of what happened in January, uh, which was a tester. So that's a tick. Um, second, thing, second thing is that we've, we have our own security person, um, and that person we have or has had experience with the All Blacks, uh, the Super 14 teams, the Sevens teams. So he's got that relationship with all New Zealand sporting teams, and he is awesome. So uh, he feels like my father, sort of, you know, he's that father figure, but you also very feel very safe. He's got an ex um what do you call it, uh, police background um, and knows a lot of the police or the government as well. So he's got that connection in there. So we are very clear about the protocols we have to use and probably that's the first and foremost to make sure everybody's safe. Just um, finally from me, Knowles, how do you feel at this stage of the run to the World Cup compared to back in 2019 uh, when the last World Cup was? How are you feeling in terms of selection, quality of netball out there? Where are you sitting in comparison to that moment? Oh, that's a good question. Look, 2019, sometimes you only know what you know and you go in all blind, <laughs> uh, you know, so it's totally different. Um, having in 2019, you know, the likes of the Fossils who mm. were players that have been there, done that, but also um, really strong of where they are as individuals in their own competition. And obviously at that time you had Maria and also Laura that was playing in SSN. So they had... Um, uh, um, connection, I suppose, with the Australian style, and it was day in, day out. So there was a sort of a level of confidence um, going in to Netball World Cup. But also, because I had come in the way that I did, you know, it wasn't that I didn't care about things, but, you know, the only way was up. You know, <laughs> now that you're up, the only way is down. You know, so, um, you know, it's, it's making sure... Not that you're defending things, but once again, planning is really meticulous and that um, we're over everything, whether it's the SCCN or the players, um, thinking about the coaches. Um, every week for ANZ, I'm excited. Next minute, somebody goes walkabouts <laughs> and then I'm thinking, oh my gosh, I don't know where they are. But I think we're healthy. You know, I think we're in a healthy position. The scoreboard shows that, so which means it should create pressure for individuals. It means that the um, top three is not secured. So hopefully that goes right through to the end of the competition where we know where everybody is on the pecking order. Um, and at the moment, there's been great shifts in individuals. So, you know, that's all we ask. Um, and that there's progression and then when the team is selected that's when Debs, I and also the other management do our thing so just got to get the base and the foundation as strong as possible and be smart on the selections. Well, we love hearing from you Knowles, we love to hear that the competition is healthy and the close games are keeping you excited if um, also giving you a few headaches but all the best for watching the rest of the season and for the upcoming World Cup and hopefully we can chat to you before then. Cool, thanks guys. Oh, isn't she great? Fascinating things coming out of that. Yep, six in the spine. I'm six going away and starting riding my six. Well, and I'm going to start choosing 15 players. True. Five, five, five split. What's she going to do? So much to discuss. Maybe we will pick our spine next week. We're going to have to top this week's episode somehow. Make sure you do join us next week for another episode of Inside Netball. But for now, thank you for joining us on Sky Sport.